Welcome everybody here tonight. Um, we're very lucky to have a, a speaker here tonight that's taking on the task of starting a new group. Um, and I think you'll notice here it's Stop Police Brutality Now. And uh, this has just been a topic that's been on a lot of people's minds because it's been in the, you know, it's been on the airways. Uh, but not enough. So he's going to explain it to us. But this is Stephen Paulson, a, a good friend of mine. Um, he was in the he was a military police in the Air Force for six years. He's been an activist for over ten years. Um, I've met him through Ron Paul, and he was very uh, faithful fighter there. And I'm glad to call him a friend. And I, he's going to explain to us tonight his ideas and his goals for his new group. Great. So welcome. Thanks, Regina. I get a hug. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Oh, wow. hey, Stephen, some of us can't see that far. What's the name of your website? Yeah, so it's uh, stoppolicebrutalitynow.com. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, a friend and I got to uh, kicking these stories around, and we've probably been doing this for about a year. Uh, there's a couple websites that uh, you may be uh, familiar with. One's called the Free Thought Project. Uh, there's another one that's called Cop Block. Uh, these are pretty, uh, pretty informative. They generally vet the stories pretty well. Um, and uh, so I started watching all these, and I started thinking to myself, wow, man, it's really brutal out there, you know? Or, 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 these cops are just really getting out of hand. What's going on? And so as Regina mentioned, I was a, a police officer in the Air Force. And I remember going through our uh, academy, which was a, um, you know, I mean, it was, it was a military police department. We were trained in military uh, tactics for dealing with uh, uh, offenders on the base or anybody that wanted to come across the base. We were responsible for defense of the base. And our tactics weren't as uh, extreme as, as what we see today. And uh, so I, I started watching all this stuff and I thought, you know, um, I don't think the average citizen really realizes um, how brutal uh, some of these, uh, some of these uh, situations turn out to be. So Kelly Thomas, anybody ever heard of Kelly Thomas? Yeah. That's a name you should Google, uh, Kelly Thomas. <laughs> this gentleman was um, a, 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 had a mental disorder, was homeless, was outside a nightclub, and I believe it was in Oakland. Um, he was confronted by um, by the uh, owner of the uh, establishment uh, through a bouncer and was asked to leave because the, he was uh, scaring away customers that wanted to come into the establishment. This is a guy that's sitting on the ground. Um, kind of had a, um, a Jerry Garcia look to him, you know, just a kind of a, a hippie looking, disheveled type of cat just hanging out. So um, there was a, a confrontation between the bouncer and him and um, but not physical on Kelly's part. Um, it came to be that about six police officers ended up beating the crap out of this guy, killing him. Um, during the altercation, Kelly Smith cried out like 30 times for his father to help him out. This was a mentally uh, challenged individual that, that had to, he didn't have the mental capacity to even understand what the, you know, the severity of this beating he was going through. Um, so check that out, Kelly Thomas. There's a lot of video on it, and that's what really inspired me to reach out to a friend of mine in Hollywood that actually works on a, a couple of TV shows. One's The Office, you may have heard of The Office. Uh, the other's The Mindy Project. That's uh, kind of a spinoff from that. And uh, so I, I told this guy, I said, you know what, I, I, I'd like to get um, some interest together, some support to do a documentary. I think we need to, not just show the Kelly Thomases, and I'm amazed that uh, some of you haven't heard of it, but some of the ones that uh, are just as bad as Kelly Thomas, but not heard of at all. And I uh, wanted to really kind of get a public awareness together, and he said, hey man, that sounds really good, but you know what I think we really need to do? I think we need to um, kick that off with a, uh, an awareness and accountability campaign. And I thought, well, that's a fantastic idea. <coughs> You know, so what we can do is we can drive the public awareness, but the accountability campaign is what's really important here, because we want to put together items on the on a on a ballot to get voted on that will give us the ability to get the accountability from these police departments that really have no oversight. 
So let's say you uh, call the city of Dallas because the city of Dallas has whooped your ass real bad. You want to find out exactly how far up the ladder can I go? Well, let's say you get all the way up to the mayor, right? And the mayor's going to tell you, well, I really don't handle that. You know, that's really, that's handled by the, the, the chief of police. And that's really where it ends. It really ends with the chief of police. I mean, it really does. It's a, it, it, there is no real um, arm twisting oversight except for when it comes time for re-election. Okay, so I, I'm just telling you that um, we decided that we have to have things put in place to where we can get that accountability because we can't rely on, on any accountability from council or anything like that, city council. So what we're asking for is we're asking for body cameras on every police officer body cameras in every patrol car. And this isn't a, this really isn't a point of, uh, of negotiation. This is something that we're really demanding to have. Um, it, it, it's a win situation for both sides, to be honest with you. We're getting pushback right now from the, um, uh, from the uh, unions, right? So one union official said, well, hey, listen, we think body cams are a great idea, but you can't use them against the police officers, right? So we're like, what the hell, you know, I mean, well, of course we can, you know, not only, you know, they're like, they're thinking, oh, yeah, the body camera's great because we're going to catch everybody doing everything all the time. And you know what? That's fine. We're not against good law enforcement. All right. We are not anti-police. Okay. We are anti-brutality, man. We're tired of seeing people get beat. We're tired of seeing people get shot. We are tired of seeing people harassed. Brutality not only comes in the form of physical um, beatings, but it's also that, it, that intimidation, that, uh, that bullying aspect you get. You know, I'll tell you, I, I travel an awful lot for my job, and um, several weeks ago, I was in Charlotte Airport, and I decided, man, I wanted something to eat. I had like a three-hour layover, because we really screwed up at work, and so I'm stuck in Charlotte. And I've got like a three-hour layover, and I want something good to eat. So I see these two cops there, you know, and I walk up to these two guys, and I'm kind of dressed like I am now, and I walk up to these guys to ask them, hey guys, you know a good place to eat around here, I'm sure, right? And so as I, as I walk up there, they're joking with each other, but I get up there and their whole demeanor changes, man. I mean, they are like, yeah, what's going on? Okay, uh-huh, you need some place to eat, really? Hmm, no, you know. I mean, the, it was just the interaction. Um, there's no, uh, there's no, um, what I want, what's the word I want to look for? There's just no connection with the people. There's just no connection. There's this hierarchy, right? And all that comes from the culture. And the culture comes from the training. And the training right now is more military than I ever had when I was training as a, as a military police officer, right? And I carried an M16, M60 machine gun, M203 grenade launcher, and those were part of my regular accoutrements. And uh, I'm telling you right now, I was nicer to people that approached me on any given day with any of those weapons on than these clowns are because there's just no, they don't know how to interact with people. And that all happens from uh, within inside. That's the culture that, that's being manifested through these academies. So because of that, we're going to ask for mandatory re-evaluation of mental awareness through the course of their career. So um, every three years, and again, these are talking points that we want to have. And we're, and we're doing it through this website. We're also doing it through the Facebook page. Because we don't want just Stephen's ideas and, and Natalie's ideas and maybe Jessica's ideas um, just thrown in a group and say, okay, this is what we're going after. We want to hear from you people. We want to understand, hey, what's important to you? What, what do you feel accountability is? And what can we, what can we really put together in, in, in on a nice, tidy platform and, and give this to our legislative body and say, hey, these are the things we want. We the people, these are the things that we want. These are the things that we need to have to feel comfortable being policed by your police department. So that's why we started this. That's why I'm a part of it. And what I'm asking you to do is go to this website, take a look at it. There's some fantastic facts on here. There's our solutions that we have for accountability. Um, there's also a place where you can sign up to volunteer to be an organizer or to assist in organizing. Um, we can never use too many hands um, to help us out. 
We're self-funded. We'll eventually have probably a chip-in button on here. I was talking to uh, my co-part in Los Angeles. We do have about 22 organizers already. Um, we have them as far as uh, Brooklyn, New York, up to um, uh, Utah, and in uh, California. We have several here. Jessica's handling the uh, Tarrant County event for us. Um, there's a Facebook page as well. Same thing, Stop uh, Police Brutality Now. It's a group Facebook page. I ask if you are on Facebook, go to that page, um, like it. Uh, at that point, uh, you can automatically get involved in uh, reading the post that we put on there. You can comment. We welcome your ideas and suggestions. There's also another um, page on there. It's an organizer's page, and it's Stop Police Brutality Now Organizers. So if you wanted to be an organizer and you didn't go to the website but you're on the page, you can ask to join that, and, and we'll put you on there at that point. Now, I know some of you guys probably don't have Facebook, right? Um, so then here's the deal. If you go to my website, I think everybody in here probably accesses the Internet. So if you go to my website, um, there is a place there that you can sign up um, to, to help, to volunteer. Now, if you just put in there that, hey, I'm not really looking to organize, but I'd like to stay updated, I don't have Facebook, we'll be more than happy to put you on an information list and send you out, um, uh, you know, uh, dates and things of that nature. The date that we're looking for, at first we were like, we were like really gung-ho and enthusiastic. We were like, man, let's do this in November. And then we were like, oh man, we can't do this in November. It's, it was not enough time. And it was like, what about January? Oh yeah, well, it's going to be cold. And it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we're going to do this in spring of 2015. And one of the things that we decided was we want to make a week out of it. So we don't want to really confine anybody or any, any organization in a different city to one particular day. We want to make it an awareness week. So we want this to be, uh, we want to give the, uh, uh, the, the, the autonomy to these organizers to have their event anytime during that week. And then of course we'll take that information and, and all the events will be uploaded on this, on this site, all the, you know, the YouTube, uh, we'll, we'll have that uploaded. We're also um, asking the organizers to have conversations with their chiefs of police. And you can also do this. We're looking to take um, these conversations and incorporate them into the documentary. Um, what we would like you to do is we'd like you to take our, um, our talking points that we have as solutions on the website and use those as talking points for your chief of police. And if you can do that on video, that would be like so fantastic. Um, because again, we can take this and we can use this as part of the documentary. Um, so that's what we're doing. And this is something that I think everybody can get behind because I don't think anybody here is like, yeah, no, police brutality is cool. Yeah, no, it's the way to go. No, that guy deserved that. His head kicked in. Now, again, let me um, you know, digress and tell you that we are not anti-police. We are not anti, um, you know, good law enforcement. But uh, we're not for this militarized, um, you know, uh, intimidation force, this revenue kind of seeking mentality and and uh, we, we are to and it's the apathy of the good police that we're really having. And I have people tell me, well, there's good cops out there. Well, then the good cops need to stop these bad cops from beating these guys' ass and these chicks, you know, and then raping these girls and, and just doing all this crazy damage. So it's hard for me to really embrace any of it right now until the culture really starts to kind of look at it within itself and, and starts to change. Now, I did have a friend of mine that is a pastor in Alabama for a police department. And after a couple of weeks, he was telling me, he goes, man, Stephen, he goes, every time I see someone on your page, you're like just slamming cops. What's happened to you? You know, we, we were cops in the Air Force together. You know, what's going on with you, man? I said, I'm not making this stuff up, Wash. His name's Washington. I said, Wash, I'm not making this stuff up, man. This is what's really happening. And I showed him three videos right in a row. I posted them on my Facebook page right in a row of incidences that occurred in the state of Alabama 
One was a police officer molesting a 12 year old child on the Gulf Coast. Th these are real, these are things that are happening. It's, it's, the, it's the video, it's the media, man, that you know, you really gotta embrace that because now we understand what's going on. It used to just be we hear, we hear stuff. Oh, you know, this guy got his butt whooped, oh yeah, but you know, he's always talking noise anyway, so he probably deserved his butt whipped. Well, that's not the case anymore. Now the fact is, you know, people are getting shot before they can even get their driver's licenses out. Um, people's animals are getting shot uh, for, you know, for acting like an animal. Um, you know, uh, people uh, are waking up in the middle of the night to see a SWAT team invade their house on a no-knock warrant and are shooting back and, uh, and dying uh, for no reason at all. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. The militarization of the police force, too, is something we're wanting to not just scale back. We'd like to see that dismantled and we'd like to see it compartmentalized into what SWAT really is as opposed to SWAT being used for poker games and marijuana plants in somebody's uh, grow room. Um, so over five million or five billion dollars has been spent on militarization since the 90s. So that's a lot of money that we could probably be using on other programs. So that's what we're doing. I'd like to have your uh, support. We're, uh, uh, we'll be kicking it off in uh, 2015, uh, the spring of 2015 for the protest. We're gonna have it downtown uh, in the um, uh, City Hall area where we did the Monsanto event. I don't know where you're gonna do yours because I guess we're gonna have to still talk about that. Uh, and uh, Corey Watkins from the uh, 2A group that uh, Red mentioned on the Open Carry, Tarrant, Open Carry Tarrant County. He's gonna speak at our event. I think we might have John J. Myers. I'm a libertarian, small L lib, but uh, <laughs> I am, and so, you know, I'm all about, hey man, embracing everybody, and you know, let's just try to get this nonsense uh, knocked out. So I appreciate your support, really do. Thanks a lot. Yeah. As of and didn't I had a conversation with the paralegal. He said Denton County is ground zero for the police state. Um, he says he regularly has people coming into his, his criminal. He, he's currently with a criminal defense firm. Uh, people who go to jail, smart off a little bit to the jailer, get the shit beat out of them, right. and then when they go and get the the video, somehow magically disappears. Sure. So having something, some kind of a way of keeping it cop proof the cameras might be a good idea. Also, any kind of legislation that makes it a felony for a police officer to um, tamper with that kind of evidence or um, you know, basically hold them to the same laws that the rest of us. I've seen three times in my life, I've seen a cop draw down on someone, draw a sidearm on someone, and none of those cases, well, Two of the cases, three of them, well, they could have been, an argument could have made that, that, that they could have potentially have been a threat, but there was no weapon present, they didn't see a weapon present. I can understand the officer maybe having his gun down, but when the officer points the gun at someone, that is assault with a deadly weapon, that's a felony. And yeah, I mean, it, again, I think it all talks to, speaks to the culture and the way that uh, they're being trained now. The de escalation skill set is like nil. You know, it's now, it's not, uh, you know, when you're drawn down on someone. You know, years ago, I, I drew down on a guy with an, I had an M16. I drew down on a guy at AK-47. He was maybe from meter to, cam meter to camera away. And he's walking towards me. I was 19 years old, uh, maybe 20. I was scared to death. And uh, I remember popping over the car and asking this guy to freeze. And my first sergeant's down here below my pant. He's pulling on my pant. He's going, Halson, don't shoot him, don't shoot him. You know? Um, nowadays, the guy would have been like a freaking uh, Swiss cheese roll, you know? So it's, again, I think it's that culture. It's what they're being taught in the academy. And these cops are getting like these, all, all this brand new kick-ass gear. They, they go out, they look like Joe, G.I. Joe. They can't wait to use it. It's like Christmas, man. So they can't wait to use it. So we've got to, we got to start scaling back and, and, and kind of get back to that, you know, that Andy Griffith type of uh, police officer, man, where peace people officer. are actually peace, peace officers. Right, right. exactly. Yes, sir. Well, you know, there's a few ways to go around this. Mm -hmm. One is we need to set a meeting 
with the city council that three minutes and when they ask you what you want to talk about, mm -hmm. say we need uh, we need to talk about the police corruption and we want the chief of the police to be present. This is going to be televised or possibly even they hear it on the radio, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The second, we need to file against them in court. And if I study the law correctly, you can defend yourself against the police brutality by shooting them. If they abuse you, the law say that you are entitled to do that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. you, you can definitely resist an unlawful arrest. Yes, sir. I remember reading years ago about police in Japan. Uh, apparently, they try to assign policemen an area, a block or blocks, whatever. And they are to get to know all of the shopkeepers and, or all of the residents and say, you know, I'm here as your servant to help sure. and so forth. And in Japan, all the police officers are required to take a course in flower arranging to develop, <laughs> to develop their sensitivity. And they're very serious about that. There's a, there's a lot of psychology. psychology. Would you be willing to, willing to speak at the city council? Wait, he's still yeah. talking to Scott. Yeah. And we, we asked that we want the police officer, the chief of the police, to come in. And I guarantee you, I'll bring you at least 10 people. Yeah, no, that's no problem. We'll, we'll definitely have conversations. You were saying the psychology. Uh, well, it's have to be in the big room. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let Red talk for just a minute. Uh, Mr. Report, uh, there's a lot of psychology in play in these things and improving uh, the issues that we have at hand. Um, as far as that, I have a connection with nature. It creates a, uh, it kind of allows our compassionate characteristics or compassionate element within its surface. And sure, absolutely. How we can have a strong connection with people. Yeah, yeah, I mean, good energy. I mean, it's all about good energy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to discuss, I'd like to discuss. I'm sorry, Albert wasn't through. This Albert. Oh, oh, Albert. One other area I think that needs to be addressed in every police department is the narcotics division. Okay. Because there is huge money available to those officers to corrupt them in that area. Now, in 1978, other friends know about this, I, I was a lawyer, and I got a man out of jail on a heroin charge. He was framed. That case fell right in the middle of the fact that the Dallas Narcotics Division was trying to muscle the mafia out of heroin trade and take it over for themselves. Oh, yeah. And it was very dangerous. I had a hit contract out on my own life for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And this was verified from several in the police department as well as mafia nightclub owner and so forth. But this is this is one area I think that is huge for the corruption in police departments. I know of it's happening in towns all around this area. Well, yeah, I, I, I would totally agree. I mean, my personal stance is that to end the, end the war on drugs. I mean, that's my personal opinion, and I think that you you you, you put the kibosh on a lot of that uh, on a lot of that crap that goes on from the from the abuse aspect of people getting beat and, and drug out of their cars for marijuana and you know petty petty uh, drugs to uh, you know to the uh, uh, corruption that uh, in, in, internal and through the well, parts. The war on drugs is the war on the competition because that's CIA and defense intelligence. Right. <laughs> okay, John. Okay, a couple of quick examples of uh, areas. And I want to know, my question to you is whether you've heard of this being done by police. One thing is when they go to cuff you, mm -hmm. is they will twist your arm up behind your back and basically break out your, uh, uh, your elbow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I had an officer attempting to do that to me, and I had to decide whether I wanted my wrist broken or my elbow broken. And I decided on my wrist, and I'm trying to talk to him calmly, saying, you can cuff me, I'm not resisting. You can cuff me, there's room to cuff me. Instead of him trying to, and he was literally lifting me up off the ground mm -hmm. from, you know, yeah. trying to absolutely my wrist. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that, that type of, you know, it, it's no different than, I'm sure everybody in here has at, at one point been really mad. Yeah. And when you get really mad, you tend to do stupid stuff. This and that's exactly what, uh, I understand. What he's trying to I say. understand, but I mean, that, that's, that's what happens. They, it's that, that adrenaline rush, they're so enraged that it's just for that. And these are probably good people 99% of the time, but then just that one thing that clicks them off and if they are unstable mentally in any capacity, maybe they're bipolar, maybe they're a borderline personality disorder, who knows what's going on there, right? And so just that one thing that clicks them off, and a lot of it is just that they have this narcissistic, I find that a lot of, 
and I hate really saying this because I have a lot of police officers that I really, I really like as people, but it seems like there's this personality of them that's kind of this narcissistic, authoritarian type of personality that's kind of drawn to that job. And, uh, you know, you challenge their authority just by talking to them sometimes. Just, you know, it's just like when I was asking those guys, where's a good place to eat? It was almost like a challenge to them, you know? And it was just really ridiculous. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. So, yeah, yeah I, I don't doubt that that happens. That's part of training. Can I one, other, one other thing. Um, I was coming up from Houston. I was stopped. I had a big camera case in my truck seat next to me. It was, you know, really kind of cramping me. But I had a camera worked on at a shop down in Houston. <coughs> I was pulled over for a uh, for a burnt out um, plate light. Oh sure. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to search that on a dark night, cold night. They wanted to search that camera case, and I would not give them permission. Good. And they stood me out there for over 20 minutes in the cold, and then the officer tried a trick. He shouted from the cruiser, he shouted at me, he said, get your hands out of your pockets. My hands were not in my pockets. I'm figuring he wanted me to go like this. If I would go like that, he'd be able to fire on me. He, he, he could definitely make a case for it. There's something called the nickel, uh, the nickel ride. Everybody, anybody ever hear of the nickel ride? So here's what it is. So they throw you in the back of a, you've seen a paddy wagon, right? Or a van, right? And so what they do is they handcuff you, put handcuffs behind you, and then they throw you in the back of the van, right? And now what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to seat belt you in, in the back of one of those vans. Or there's supposed to be a gentleman in the back of that van with you to make sure you're not getting tossed all around. So nickel ride, uh, and that comes from the old uh, saying that back in the old days, the fair, the, the rides were a nickel. And you'd get on those things, and when you get off them, you're black and blue because those things would beat you all to death. You guys remember those, right? Those metal rides. Right? Well, that's where this came from, the nickel ride. Because by the time you got out of, that, uh, out of the back of that van, you look like you've been on one of those nickel rides back at the uh, fair when you were a kid because they would slam the brakes on, they would turn, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, that's what they would do, and they'd rough you up, but they never roughed you up. You understand what I'm saying? You get, they, they get to uh, the in-processing pound, and they open it up, and you're all beat to hell. Well, that's the way they got you. Nobody's laid a hand on you. So that's the nickel ride. So things like what you're talking about, you know, lifting you up at the, you know, stuff like this. Yeah, man, that happens all the time, man. I mean, when you get, anybody ever had handcuffs put on? Okay. They ever, did they put them on nicely or did they put them on? They put them on. Too tight. And, and normally when they put them on, they do put them on too tight. And, you know, they, they double lock them. You know, they're supposed, to, they're supposed to double lock them, but by the time they double lock them on you, they're already crunched down on your wrist. And so, I mean, it's not a, it's, you know, I'd like to tell people don't smart off to the cops, you know, do the right thing. But the bottom line is, I'm with, with Red. If we don't exercise our rights, um, they are, um, you know, they, they go away by attrition, you know. And so we have to um, uh, refuse to comply to searches. Uh, we have to uh, know what our rights are when we're being, if we're not being detained, hey, am I free to go? If I'm not being detained, I'll talk to you later. I'm going to get out of there. Remove yourself from the situation. I don't like antagonistic, um, and I do not support antagonistic behavior. I think you're just asking for trouble. So, um, you know, there are some groups that kind of antagonize the cops when they're out there. I think you're just asking for trouble. I think what we need to do is we need to attack this from the legislative uh, uh, way. We need to get some, some laws on the books for, uh, for on our behalf. And uh, we need to get uh, the populist awareness that this is going on everywhere. A friend of mine in Michigan said, hey, we don't have it that bad here. I guarantee you, I could spend 30 minutes and I could pull up so much crap just from Michigan, I would just blow his mind away. So it's everywhere. And uh, it's here, it's in the small towns, it's in the big towns. and. So, you know, I don't want to bore you guys with no, anything else. No, you're not boring. I, I have two, two things to One say. More. Go ahead. Let him say something. Yeah. <laughs> the best Let's thing we you. can do is legalize the drug because that's 80% of the problem. No, I, I think, yeah, any drug Stop the war on drugs. It's failed. I think another thing is if they can have a camera, then we, we should be able to do the same thing. Well, I think you should always videotape the police. Yes. Right. Always. So there's apps on copwalk.org. If you go to the app uh, resources, page on copblock.org. There's an app for your smartphone 
that you can download to your smartphone so that you push a button, it starts recording, and it saves a, a copy to your to your phone hmm. and simultaneously uploads a copy oh, wow. to the internet so that when the cop steals your camera or breaks your camera or deletes it from your camera, he has he has to delete it the one that's on the internet. Oh, that's great. I didn't know about that. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's that's good. good. But, the, but the other thing too is, can I finish this? The other thing too is, is cops have a problem with you videotaping. Not all, but some. So, that, that should be in the law that you, you should be able to. It is. Well, it is. Yeah. It is. John, it I is. think that's under development. I think you're in the development phase. Can I freaking talk? So, so, anyway, check so on it. Keep checking on it. Ah, Jesus. I got you. I got you. So you had something to say. Uh, um, I really don't know what is a police officer's action, what is, what is their job, is, and what is the definitions of the police officer. Well, that's a, that's a good point, you know, because actually, you know, um, the Supreme Court has ruled that it is not the duty of the police officer to protect you. It's actually the duty of the police officers to enforce the laws. That's it. And so, for instance, like if a police officer saw you bleeding and getting beat up by somebody, it wouldn't necessarily be his responsibility to protect you any further than enforcing the law that's being broken at that particular time. So that's changed. You, you know that protect and serve, that's really changed a great deal according to the Supreme Court. Now, you know, again, small and a libertarian, I'm saying not everything the Supreme Court, you know, says yes or, uh, yes or no on do I agree with. So just because they say so doesn't make it so. As far as I'm concerned, um, if you're a taxpayer and, um, uh, and, and you're in trouble, that police officer, in my opinion, when he signed up on the dot line, puts his life in a, in a, in a, in a, in a matter of risk uh, for, for the people that he should be um, enforcing the laws to protect. That's the way I feel. So. More and more government, particularly from the top down worldwide, is moving the world towards slavery. That's just, to me, crystal clear. Oh, well, yeah, we're all slaves. And, and what we need to do is start from the ground level where we are and interface with these police departments and on up to help them understand that we're all part of the same community. Absolutely, I agree 100%, and that's exactly what we're doing. And when I was telling you that we want the organizers to uh, have dialogue yes. with the police chiefs, yes. this is what I'm talking about, changing the culture. I want our organizers to be a really big part of this movement that, uh, that is that is entering into dialogue at that level and so because we believe that's going to filter down when I was telling you about my buddy Washington he told me about three weeks after we first talked about my page uh, he comes and tells me hey man you know what you're right this stuff is going down he goes I passed up a couple of promotions because I saw this going on in our department I've actually contacted the chief of police and we're going to have a community meeting of other chiefs, and we're gonna talk about this and discuss that. And that was just from one single conversation I had with one guy. That's activism, that's how it works, and that's what we need to do. And we have to, as citizens, as people, or whatever you wanna classify yourself as, we owe it to our society, we owe it to each other, we owe it to ourselves um, to, to be involved. And uh, as you said, um, we need to, this needs to happen uh, at this grassroots level, the dialogue needs to happen. So these police officers, because these cops that are running the streets are your neighbors, they're my neighbors, they're regular people. Um, they know when they go home at night um, how they're how they're felt about, how they're talked about. That's a heavy burden for them to to, to carry. I guarantee it. Um, so um, I know that in the back of their mind. There are the majority of these cops, the good cops that are out there, they want some type of change. They want to see a cultural change. But the peer pressure amongst these police departments is amazing. If, you, if you're a whistleblower, and that's another thing that we have asked for in our objectives, is that we want protection for whistleblowers within the police departments. Because if you're a whistleblower, you are given the worst assignments, you're ostracized, you're not part of the good old buddy system anymore. Your life is hell, man. So it's very it's it's just a lot easier to kind of go with the flow and, and I didn't see that type of uh, you know that, that type of mentality. My situation with the handcuffs 
circumstance. I was in a fast, 40 day fast, that's 30 days, 33 days into the fast water on me. And uh, wife got, like I said, that we had a count, a uh, judge in next condo. She dealt with him. He got the sheriffs out there. And they, uh, uh, all I was going to do is lay on for the truth. <laughs> right. And uh, the, uh, they handcuffed me, took me to the uh, mental division of the, of the uh, Dallas, the, the Dallas hospital. You know. And uh, it, I mean, I, I said, handcuffs? <laughs> right. Well, yeah, you look like you're a pretty wild guy, so. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, uh, that, was, that was it. I finished my 40 years fast. <laughs> well, that's terrible. I'm sorry to hear that. I missed one meal. Wow. Um, well, well, this is awesome in so many ways. Thanks. In Dallas, um, I know that I talked to you about, the, 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 I talked to the chief of police in Dallas, and he says they are for cameras. I thought I was going to have to sell them on it. And he goes, no, we're for them. We're looking for a good price because they're about $4,000 a piece. Wow. He said, I go, that seems awful hefty. And he goes, well, they have to be very rugged and blah, blah, blah. So it's a budget issue. But I said, well, get a few of these companies to loan them for six months and get another company to loan them for six months, you know? That's what I would do, right? He's like, good fun. So anyways. But, no, right? So yeah. But the, no, no, don't leave yet. No, 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 I, want to, I want to ask you a question, sure. too. Um, um, and it's nice that everybody has so much interest in this, isn't it? That's no, awesome. it's great. It's yeah. great. I mean, well, um, I think it's something everybody can yeah, relate it's, to. Yeah, it's very um, practical what you're doing, and it's pulling it together on a national uh, basis, which is really great about having a week, you know? Yeah, I think that's it works That's a great better, idea. Right? And in the spring, awesome. Yeah, wow, a lot that's, more flexible. That's really, I know it's exciting. You want to do it right away. But if you give it a little time, it's a lot better. But um, I'm curious about their training. Like, you know your military training. It must be very standardized. Is it by city that the, um, the training, or is it by state? Who controls how a police officer is trained? Right. Do you know? So, yeah, so um, academies will get their curriculum from several different places, right? Okay. So what I'm hearing now, and I haven't confirmed this, but one of the things I've heard that um, the, I believe it's the 1033 program, and that's the, that's the Pentagon militarization program. Yeah. Uh, once, uh, in, in order to have uh, some of these uh, uh, products um, allocated, then they, uh, they agree to um, a certain training program that they will put their, their, their police officers through. Right, and so I know that's where some of this. One bad uh, thing so, so, another bad thing. Right, so right. that's where some of this, uh, you know, this militarized uh, type of training is, is actually coming from. And then, as far as um, who do, who does it, you know, it just depends. I mean, I, I think that there are some municipalities that will probably um, have a an academy that will train several different, okay. um, several okay. different cities, uh, because not every city obviously would be big enough to have its own police academy, right? Right. Um, and then, of course, you have the Dallas Police Academy, you have the Fort Worth Police Academy. Those are those are huge cities and you know large uh, large academies. But one of the things that we'd like to try to do, and um, I know uh, you and I have a friend that's a sheriff, ran, or yeah. ran for sheriff rather, and I'd like to see if he can actually, or if anybody, if you know of anybody, can actually get their hands on some training manuals, some academy training manuals. Let's take a look at them. Let's see what they're let's see what yeah. they're learning. Let's see and what they're we teaching. Can add men yeah. or not. One more thing I yeah, can good. say, well, these people keep yeah. talking. Um, you know, I, everyone knows my background with the John Birch Society, but they started this program 40 years ago. It was support your local police and keep them independent. Another thing we're running into is these are not all just our neighborhood policemen. They are coming in. They're they're federalizing a lot of the That's true, man. That's and very this true. is very bad. So what they were, oh, what I was hearing that was a good idea is getting more of the police officers on the street to be foot policemen. That's another thing, to have the contact, like you said, in, in Japan, where you get to know your neighborhood, you have the same policemen in your area. It, because it's harder for them to be mean to you when they realize that you're just one of them. And that's why the bad guys set up this thing of having that detachment of having the federal police and stuff. So all of this is not an accident. A lot of it is a setup, so <laughs> we know that. One more thing, and let's see, let's take two more questions. 
And then we might, is it almost time? What time is that? Anybody? Okay, we'll end it, and then people can still keep talking. It's just that we'll end the meeting. But we'll do Albert, and then we'll do Jerry. Okay, okay two real quick things. Years ago, I had a friend who was going to go through the police academy, and he was taking the training, and things would come up in the discussion, and he would bring up constitutional issues. Well, he was taken aside after class and told to shut up and not bring up constitutional no. issues. And he dropped out of the training. That is really now. What, and what academy was this? Part, I, some Texas okay. training. I don't even remember okay. which one it was. Also, I'm uh, hearing that some of the police departments are getting rid of that military equipment that the federal government has been giving them. Well, I'll tell you this. I know that I know the. Um, they put the kibosh on a couple of police departments. I don't know how readily some of these police departments are giving up their equipment. <laughs> I would su I would suggest that's. I would be shocked if that's happening. But I know that there are some um, uh, some kiboshes on the programs going to some of these police departments because of um, uh, theft of these. Uh, of, of the like, I think there was like lost one it. police department that uh, <laughs> yeah lost the Humvee. Yeah. They can't find a Humvee. Um, there's, uh, I think there was another police department has uh, has come up with four missing M14s. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you know, it's um, yeah, I don't know what's going on with this stuff, but uh, they're probably selling it on Craigslist. I don't know, but but I know that that you know, anytime you're anytime you've got all this military equipment kind of running around, and, they want to play with it. Yeah, they want to play with it, so they don't tell them where to. You had one one other quick thing, I don't know if this is related in any way or if you've run across this, but <clears throat> a friend of mine was driving along the road the other day out near Garland and he saw three Russian military vehicles driving along on the highway. Mm. He couldn't get their attention, they'd slow up and, or speed up and so forth, and they went into Garland. <coughs> Russian. <coughs> Russian. Well, that, that's interesting. I have not seen that. Um, that would definitely, you know, raise an eyebrow, I suppose. I mean, was it a U, was it UN? It was, or was that Russian? So they were armored vehicles. Yeah. Armored vehicles. I know that there's, I know there's some UN vehicles running around here every now and then. You know, you never know what that, you never know what's going on, to be honest with you. Sometimes it's right in front of our face. Other times it's, you know, it's in the, the dark of night. I mean, look, let's not, let's not fool anybody. It, stuff's going on. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So what we can do, I think, is do what we can do and that's what I'm trying to do is get people to change things that we can change and the immediate is you every one of you can come in can come in contact with one of these cops tonight as soon as you walk out of here you can get pulled over you can you can be somewhere and be in a situation where you are just innocently kind of brought into it and, and you're dealing with, uh, you know, one of these knucklehead um, law enforcement officers, okay? So it can happen to anybody, any one of us at any given time. Because I look at you, I look at you, I don't see you guys as, as wild-looking, crazy-looking guys, but yet you both have stories of harassment. So, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm sure every one of us probably has a story. Albert, uh, Jerry was the last one, yep. and then we'll break it. And I just wanted to ask one quickly about the voting. Um, was that? Was nice. I know. Okay, Jerry. Okay. Uh, to answer your question, I have my uh, sister's daughter's husband uh, was in Iraq in the military. Can you speak up just a little bit? <laughs> yes. He he. Uh, they're from Cedar um, Cedar City, Utah, and he is now in charge of the SWAT team in this little town. His training, he was sent to federal training for three months. Even, you know, for a his wife was sent to spend time with him while he was there. <clears throat> so they have federal training going on for these guys. This is a small town. I don't know what they do in a large town. Well, you That's can imagine. He was trained yeah. to lead this SWAT team. So now he is in total charge were they allocated uh were they allocated military items yes okay i think that goes along with that 1033 program where they are required to have some form of 
this militarized type of training to actually, you know, have those weapons or those vehicles or whatever the case is. So, and it's funny you say that. You say Utah. Utah. Okay, so I, 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 there's two people on the organizers page that are from Vernal, Utah. That's correct. Well, actually, one one of them is the organizer. Another one I know. Um, but these are these these people, man. I mean, they've got it on camera. And this Vernal Police Department, it can't be that big. I mean, it's like a small town. I've seen it on the map. It's really tiny, and uh, it's out in the middle of nowhere. And these cops are like, they're like over the moon, man. They're like crazy. They're like. You know, what are you doing filming me? Running over there and grabbing yeah, this guy and throwing him on the ground. And, yeah. You know, it's like, wow. this is small town USA, man. That probably, you know, you would probably never think that that would happen in a small town like Vernal, Utah. But then I saw another incident in the same town um, with, a, with a girl that uh, she couldn't get her, she wasn't getting her stuff out of her car fast enough. And the, and the cop got crazy and starts dragging her out of the car. You know, so she was, couldn't get her license and all that stuff out fast enough for the guy. So, I mean, you know, it's these things that are happening, man, that uh, it just blows me away. And, and these places like that, and a SWAT. I mean, what's he need a SWAT place? Well, a SWAT team? Know, I've been confronting him. What do you need a yeah, SWAT team? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, this is a small community. You know, you Somebody might have a poker game. Just know, guys, in Gen 21, like money, money, a lot of these small towns need yeah, money, and they get, you know. totally defended yeah. his oh, case yeah. that they need oh, sure. this like SWAT fluoride. team. Well, yeah, they're, they're. And this is a good kid. Yeah, they're, but they're, they're, they're conditioned, man. They're conditioned. That's, mm -hmm. it's all about conditioning, man. When you're told something enough, you're going to start, you know, riding the boat. And Agenda 21 and other bad things do come in at the local, very, very town level. So mm -hmm. that's another agenda they have. And I'm so sorry. Albert's got another question. Joanne had something. Maybe uh, we're going to end the meeting just because that's what we do. And then maybe you go talk to Joanne. Sure. She had a question Absolutely. for you. And other people can listen. I said we need to share the meeting is over. Talk to the city council and the Sheriff Matt. I there just had one. Can you get contact with him? Sheriff Matt, I know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that would be nice. If I don't know if they'll come. Bye, Grayleen. Okay, I said the meeting's over. Meeting's on, over. On yeah. this